Well, so all year we're focusing on learning the way of Jesus. It's kind of the uniting theme of our preaching ministry all year. And today we're continuing, we're approaching, we're not at the end, but we're approaching the end of a series on the Ten Commandments. And we've said that the Ten Commandments, as part of God's moral law, uh, reveal to us how God wants people to live, individual people and societies and the world. Now, ultimately, this way of life, this law, can be summed up in two parts, as learning to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and learning to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, these two things are simply stated, but incredibly complicated. And so it is vital for us to meditate on this law of love. Well, today we're considering the eighth command, which is a command to honor other people's stuff. (laughs) Okay, it's to honor other people's property. You shall not steal is the sum of this law. But this command is, is more about, as we've said, learning to love your neighbor as yourself than it is about learning to love your neighbor's stuff. It's about loving your neighbor. So there are so many implications of this command and the connection to the grace and the generosity of God is really fascinating to me. So there's a lot to unpack here, so let's just jump right in. If you have a Bible or a Bible app, um, please take it and open it to Exodus chapter 20. We're gonna start with verse 12, and just as we've done the last few weeks, read through the whole second half of the 10 commandments together, and then we'll unpack the eighth command today. Exodus 20, verse, starting with verse 12. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is God's word. Well, as we've said, the book of Exodus was written about 4,300 years ago by Moses, the the great prophet and leader of the people of ancient Israel. And the story of Exodus describes a key turning point in history when God rescued the people of Israel from slavery, captivity, in Egypt and entered into a covenant relationship with them, which included giving them the law. So the first four commands are focused on how to learn to love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, while the remaining six in the Ten Commandments are about loving our neighbor. So today we're focusing on the Eighth Command, which reads simply, you shall not steal. What does this mean? Well, this command prohibits or outlaws theft or the taking of someone else's property. Put it another way, we're not supposed to take things which aren't ours to take. Now, this is about honoring people, but also honoring people's property and and stuff. So this command, I believe, is really strongly connected to the 10th command, which is about the heart. It's about coveting or desiring things that, that you don't have. But first, here, the eighth command is specifically against taking something that isn't yours. Now, this is an awkward question for church, but have you ever stolen anything? You don't have to answer, okay? You don't, know, you don't have to raise your hand at this question, but did you, have you ever stolen anything? Now, maybe it seems so small and insignificant that it really didn't seem like that big of a deal. When I think of things like that, I think of like teenagers shoplifting some candy from the gas station or, or back in the year, all the way back in the year 2000. Some of you remember this. Some of you weren't born yet. But there was this company called Napster in the Wild West days of the internet, and they broke every copy, copyright law ever by letting people basically share all their copyrighted music and stuff for free. Well, it was great to receive all this free stuff, right? But actually, it was totally against the law. It didn't seem like it was hurting any, anybody. It didn't really seem like it was that wrong. But you know, if you're the gas station owner or if you're like any record company or artist, you may feel slightly different about that. Theft was directly cutting into their livelihood, their business, their income. Well, so this was against the law, but what does God think about that? 
What does the Bible have to say about the, the moral issue of theft? I mean, one of my favorite movies as a kid was Robin Hood. The whole premise of Robin Hood is about theft, is it not? Well, what should we do? Okay, let's say you are Robin Hood. What should you do if you're already guilty of, of stealing? You've already broken the eighth command. Well, for the rest of our time this morning, we're gonna look at what the Old Testament has to say about this topic first, and then we'll move to the New Testament, and then we'll finish our time by considering how the gospel connects to this command. Okay, so first the Old Testament. What does the Old Testament say about honoring other people's property? Well, there are a number of laws that give us more, way more detail than what we get in the Eighth Command. Just no stealing, as Ted said this morning. Yeah, amen. Let's close in prayer, okay? <laughs> well, there's, there's more to be said about this. So we'll continue in the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, um, in Leviticus chapter six. We'll put it up on the screens for you as well. Or if you really would like to, like hop around in your Bible, this would be a good morning to do that. If anyone sins and is unfaithful to the Lord by deceiving a neighbor about something entrusted to them or left in their care or about something stolen or if they cheat their neighbor or if they find lost property and lie about it or, okay, people are a mess, right? Or if they swear falsely about any such sin that people may commit, when they sin in any of these ways and realize their guilt, they must return what they have stolen or taken by extortion or what was entrusted to them or the lost property that they found or whatever it was that they swore falsely about. They must make restitution in full, add a fifth of the value to it and give it all to the owner on the day that they present their guilt offering. Okay, wow. So this passage gives a bunch of scenarios uh, of theft and says that when anyone realizes their guilt, they not only need to make restitution in full to pay it back or give back what you stole, but to add 20% of the value to it and give it to the rightful owner and make a sin offering to the Lord. So what this teaches us is that the situations, the circumstances around theft can be complicated and many. But when theft occurs, it requires you to both be reconciled to your neighbor, but also to God. Exodus 22 is another example. That's a section of scripture that has a bunch of different scenarios. We don't have to read that one. A bunch of scenarios of theft and over and over and over again, the Lord says that the one who is guilty of theft must make restitution. So if you break the eighth commandment, you need to make it right. Now the eighth command legally and historically, by the way, establishes the right to personal property. This means that if you own something, you have the right to keep it. For example, if you have money, congratulations, that is a feat nowadays, you have the right to keep it or spend it or give it away however you want within the rule of law. You know, of course, this command, the eighth command, doesn't give you the right to break the law with your personal property or use it for some kind of evil purpose. But I think about the kind of people and the kind of society that God wants and God wants people to live together in harmony. The highest calling, the, the greatest command is to love God and love your neighbor, love people. This is what God wants. And theft breaks those relationships. Theft breaks trust, which is the currency of love. Theft breaks trust, which distorts and and. Uh, corrupts healthy relationships. Even the threat of theft makes us defensive and suspicious of one another. Especially if you've had something stolen from you, you will not forget that feeling. Now the Old Testament law is clear. This is simply not the type of society that God wants for us. This is not God's will, it is not his way. Even if you have all the power in the world, it does not give you the right to take what you want. Now, I know that I, I have named this message, uh, honor people's property. You know, we've been trying to emphasize the positive aspects of these, of, of these 10 commandments. 
But this command goes way beyond simply taking something that isn't yours. It's also about giving people what they deserve, which I believe includes certain fundamental rights, including the right to life and to liberty. To deny someone certain unalienable rights endowed by their creator would certainly include the crimes of kidnapping or selling someone into slavery. For example, Deuteronomy 24 verse seven says, if someone is caught kidnapping a fellow Israelite and treating or selling them as a, as a slave, the kidnapper must die. You must purge the evil from among you. Now, whoa, okay, this is very serious language because as the law says, this is evil. And remember the context that we're dealing with here too. The original hearers of this law, the ancient people of Israel, they had just been liberated, freed, redeemed by God from slavery in Egypt. And they were not to return there. They were not to go back that way, return to the, the practices uh, that they saw or experienced in Egypt. They had been chosen by God out of all the peoples of the earth to be holy or set apart for the Lord, even if certain crimes were common in other places and cultures, they were to have nothing to do with them, even if it would be to their advantage or to their gain in some way. The Lord is very clear. Now I think of a story, now this happened before the time of the Exodus. I think of the story of Joseph at the end of Genesis who was sold into slavery by his own brothers because of their jealousy and their anger toward him. Now that story ended well for Joseph. Joseph told his brothers at the end of this long saga, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Now that is true, however, this doesn't mean that what happened to him was good. God takes all kinds of crazy and messed up situations and brings redemption, brings goodness out of great evil. The story really is that God is an amazing redeemer. Not that slavery was okay because it resulted in a good thing for Joseph. So, okay, the crime of theft includes uh, taking what isn't yours, but most seriously, including the theft of human life. Now, there are many other places we could turn to in the Old Testament that talk about this, but we, let's jump forward from the book of Exodus to over a thousand years in the future from that time, from the time of Moses and the Exodus to the time of Jesus and the New Testament in the Bible. So, to prepare the, the way for the coming of Jesus, the prophet John the Baptist preached a, a message of repentance and baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And many people, many people responded. All kinds of people responded. Not just like the church-going religious people of his day, everybody came. People who were known to be guilty of breaking all sorts of commandments. And John told them that they didn't need to just get baptized, that wasn't the end result of his ministry, they needed to go on to actually bear the fruit of repentance. That, that repentance should have a visible impact on their lives. Now, of course, if you do something wrong, you, you should feel bad or remorseful about that. But John wasn't saying that people should just feel bad for their sins, but their lives actually needed to go in a new direction. Repentance means to turn, turn from your way and turn towards God's way. Now, in Luke chapter three, Luke records that various groups of people wanted to know what this kind of repentance might look like for them. All right, John, I'm ready. I'm ready to turn. But what does that repentance, what would the fruit of repentance look like for me? In my life, in my vocation, in my career? Let's read this passage together, Luke three, verses 10 through 14. What then should we do? <laughs> what should we do then? The crowd asks. Great question. That's a discipleship question. What now? 
John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with one who has none. Anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors, okay, this this show reveals a little bit of the perception of tax collectors in their culture. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, well, what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. John's getting really practical here. Now, these are just examples um, of the fruit of repentance that he called people to, but they're all examples that have to do with money and resources. A godly change of heart will produce a generous person towards people in need. A person willing to share food, clothing, or something else with someone who has nothing. A godly change of heart will produce those people who are honest and fair and not exploitative in their business practices like tax collectors, the gospel, a godly change of heart, will produce people who will not use their positions of power and authority for personal gain or at the expense of people who do not have positions of power and authority, for example, soldiers. Now, notice that John doesn't say that godly people can't do business in a profitable way and, or can't wield power and authority uh, at all, but, but that they must do these things a different way, a way in line with God's will and God's way. A tax collector who refuses to play the corrupt game of their day in their industry in terms of collecting as much as they could from people in their community (laughs) without them killing you uh, so that they would get rich, or a soldier who is content with maybe their meager earnings and refuses to use the power that they have to take what they want, both honor God and, and also honor the eighth command and are in a very real sense what it looks like for them to love their neighbor. A great example of this is found in the story of a tax collector named Zacchaeus. If you grew up in church, you probably know a song related to this man, okay? We little man. Now, um, it's often, this story is often told to kids because it's kind of a, it seems like a silly story for kids, this little guy who climbs up a tree to see Jesus. But this story, honestly, I mean, we'll continue to teach this story at Gospel Kids midweek for sure, but also it should be taught at Harvard Business School. Okay, I think you'll see what I mean. Let's look at this now. Luke 19, one through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter. (laughs) People. He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. That sinner. Okay. Boy, But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, behold, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, this is so typical of Jesus, typical Jesus inviting himself over to your house and then disrupting everything when he gets there, (laughs) okay? In the best way, I mean. But he invites himself over to Zacchaeus' house, and it was was most likely one of the bigger houses in the community. Um, He was very wealthy, but it was the house of someone who was left out and despised and marginalized in some way, even though he was wealthy. And it was because of his vocation. He, he got rich by extorting his neighbors with the backing of the Roman army. 
And that was the norm for his industry and in his culture. So Zacchaeus, as a result, was wealthy but not well-liked. But when he met Jesus, he realized, he realized his guilt, as it says in the Old Testament. But then he goes way beyond what the Old Testament law even required of him. Remember, he only needed to add 20% in paying restitution to what he had taken unjustly from his neighbors. But after meeting Jesus, Zacchaeus said he would give half his possessions to the poor and pay back four times the amount that was taken. Not 20% extra, 400%. And we see a similar dynamic in the instruction of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 4, verse 28. So Zacchaeus is an example, a little case study of what the fruit of repentance looks like in regard to your stuff when you meet Jesus. Paul teaches, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. So theft takes the possessions of someone else against their will for your benefit. But the type of people and the type of society that God wants is one where people do good work and are productive, do something useful that contributes to the flourishing life of other people. And not only to provide for their needs or their, even their family's needs, but so that they would have the ability to provide for people who have nothing, who have maybe for whatever reason are not able to provide for themselves. So, you shall not steal. It's the negative prohibition. The positive intent of God behind that command, behind the eighth command, is not that people would then hoard their stuff, but that they would learn to be generous and hospitable with what they have. We see it in the fruit of repentance. We see it in the instruction of the New Testament. But all of this leads us right to the foot of the cross. The big question that we've been trying to answer all year is this. If the gospel is true, how then should we live? The Old Testament not only says that theft is wrong because people have a right to their property, but that it requires restitution and reconciliation for both God and neighbor. But also the Old and New Testaments say that theft is wrong because it prevents us from being able to be generous and hospitable toward those in need. But it's only in the gospel that we see just how generous and hospitable our God truly is. He doesn't command us to do something that he wouldn't do. He invites us to learn his way. Think about it. God the Father was not stingy and not selfish when it came to giving up his most treasured possession, that of his one and only son. And Jesus wasn't concerned with his needs or his comfort or his security when he suffered and died on the cross for the sins of the world, including when we have broken the eighth command. And the Holy Spirit doesn't steal from us, but he only gives and gives and gives. The Spirit gives us spiritual gifts. He gives us reminders of what's true. He gives us encouragement and reassurance when we need it in fact, children of God, by faith in Jesus, he speaks that identity to us when we forget. We receive grace upon grace from God, and it's clear that he doesn't need anything from us. We just get his grace lavished on us. In fact, the whole idea of Christian salvation, which is totally different than every other religion and every other philosophy in the history of the world, is that it is a gift of God's grace. God doesn't take anything from us except for our sin and death. And then he gives and he gives and he gives. He gives us forgiveness for sin. He gives us eternal life forever in his kingdom, in the heavenly kingdom. He gives us a new family in the church. He gives us a new, wonderful new purpose for our lives. 
and our work. He gives us spiritual power and draws out the fruit of his spirit in our lives over time and so much more. So you shall not steal. Why? Because God wants people who honor other people's property, who work hard and are wise with their possessions so that they're able to be generous, especially to those who are poor and in need and hospitable, welcoming in people, especially the people who are on the margins. Because God wants people who are able to build trust and love one another well. Not people who are always defensive and suspicious and of one another and only caring about their own, hoarding what they have for their own selfish gain. This is not how God has treated us in Christ. This is not the way of Jesus either. So today, may we be people who not only are careful not to take what isn't ours, but to honor what isn't ours. May we be people who are willing to make restitution, to bear the fruit of repentance if we have broken this command. And may we be people who instead are so overwhelmingly generous and hospitable that we reflect just a little bit of the light and the glory of the goodness and the will and the way of our God. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, I think what this means is that you want us to be smart with our possessions. I think what this means is that you want us to be respectful of other people's stuff and so loving our neighbor. And I think, Lord, what this means is that you want us to grow more and more into your will and your way, which is lavishing generosity, welcoming warm hospitality, seeing the fruit of repentance flourish. But Lord, we need your help to do this. This world is broken. Our desires are distorted. Life can be difficult, and we might feel the pressure to give in if the opportunity arises to break the eighth command. Lord, would you forgive us if we have? Would you help us, give us the strength and the courage and the faith to be obedient to this command? And Lord, I just pray that our lives would would bring you glory in our faithfulness and our obedience to live like this. Thank you, Father, for your son, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for empowering us to obedience. Thank you for being faithful and patient with us as we struggle through life at times. God, we love you. We thank you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.